So by cheering, how many of you were fans of slash deeply traumatized by Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> Me too. I'm still scared of pools and mirrors and clowns and I'm just completely traumatized, but I'm so excited to be here. I'm Laura Prudhomme, the Deputy Entertainment Manager of IGN. Uh, and uh, it is my pleasure to, uh, to submit for your approval the cast uh, and creative team of Are You Afraid of the Dark? Give them a round of applause. <laughs> So right here to my left, we have Raphael Casal, who plays Mr. Top Hat, the, uh, the villain of the piece. We have Liliana Ray, who plays Rachel. Give him a round of applause, guys. <laughs> Sam Ash Arnold, who plays Ka Gavin. Mia Chek, who plays Akiko. Jeremy Taylor, who plays Graham. Writer, executive producer, Ben David Grabinski, and executive producer, Matt Kaplan. Thank you guys for being here with us. Um, I guess let's start with, uh, with the executive producers. Um, Matt, um, obviously reboots and revivals are all the rage now, and Are You Afraid of the Dark is very beloved, so I'm almost surprised it took this long, but why did now feel like the right time to bring back this very beloved franchise? Well, it was actually um, Brian Robbins, who, who just became the new CEO of Nickelodeon, had taken over, who's a, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, he also directed Good Burger. He also directed Good Burger. Amazing. <laughs> And Varsity Blues. Um, and I said this was my favorite show as a kid. I had to, uh, this is the one show that uh, I grew up on and, and felt like this was the right time. And lucky enough, we, we got Ben David to agree to help us uh, write it. And uh, we went from there. I love it. Ben David, that's a good segue. Um, how are you kind of paying homage to the original without retreading? ground that we've we've explored before what kind of makes this new and different from the original uh i mean it's a very tricky balance because we're trying to make a show for 10 year olds who've never heard of it and also for people like me who grew up super obsessed with it uh which is kind of fun because the thing i really loved about it as a kid is it felt like someone was making like high octane horror for a child mm -hmm. and uh there's not a lot of that right now yeah Especially like if you were a kid like me who was not allowed to watch R-rated stuff. Like I wasn't allowed to watch Nightmare on Elm Street, but I was allowed to watch stuff made for kids. So mm -hmm. this show was like heaven to me because I yeah. liked scary uh, crap. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, but it was a great experience because Mac Kaplan is my favorite producer in Hollywood. And to be my favorite producer in Hollywood, it means you're someone who's like, hey, I want you to. Just, just hire him. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally all I really needed. He was like, hey, I think you should do this. And I said, I would love to do this. And... That was feels like about 10 days ago. Now we're here at Comic-Con <laughs> with three finished episodes. Was it, did that answer work? I don't know. Yeah, that worked perfectly. Um, obviously, we saw the very iconic opening credits. Are you guys planning on using that for your show? New Our opening part. credits are a loving homage mm. to the original ones. Uh, most of the stuff from those credits are in there, but in a modern style from like the swing set to... Uh, the boat to the door to uh, the hand holding a match, as you could see on the logo that we played. Yeah. So, anyway, you know, everyone's favorite thing about the original show tends to be the original credits, so we try not to screw that yeah. up. Yeah, it gives me chills just hearing it. I'm still like, it takes me right back to being like six years old and peeing my pants. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad <laughs> you guys are Same. bringing that trauma back to people. That's great. Um, so here we have our new Midnight Society. Um, so how about we go down the line, starting with Jeremy? Each of you tell us a little bit about your characters, who you're playing, and why, um, why each of your characters kind of feels drawn to this new Midnight Society. Um, well, I play Graham Ramey, and he's, he's a vintage horror movie lover, um, and he's a giant germaphobe. And whenever I say that, I mean, like, giant germaphobe. Uh, he's afraid of everything, but, you know, whenever, he, whenever his friends need him most, he'll, he'll put that aside and, and help them out. My character is Akiko Yamato. She is an aspiring director who loves horror. She is very straightforward, gives you the facts. It can come off as a little rude sometimes, but in the end, she's a very loyal friend. I'm Sam Ash Arnold, I play Gavin. And at school, he's a very popular kid, has a uh, group of people constantly around him listening to his stories, but he uses the Midnight Society to tell a different kind of story, something more creative 
and nerdy and cool. Cool in a better way, I think. And yeah, he he's cool around almost everyone, but Rachel is sort of a weakness for him, and he turns into this awkward, stumbly, hopefully not too painful to watch uh, <laughs> kind of guy. But yeah, he's, uh, he's a very loyal friend, and that's the most admirable thing about him, in my opinion. Hi, I play Rachel, and Rachel is the new girl to town. She doesn't have a lot of friends, and she's awkward and quirky and a very talented artist. And what I love about Rachel is she really gets to grow in the three episodes uh, through the Midnight Society and through her storytelling and her art. And I play Josh, the 34-year-old member of the Midnight Society, <laughs> who won't leave. He won't age out. I was really worried that having a 34-year-old guy in the Midnight Society would rub original fans the wrong way. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to change things. hoping no one would notice. Yeah. And honestly, I think that he really adds a lot to the show as an adult in the group. How do you do, fellow kids? Yes, tell us a little bit about Mr. Top Hat. He actually Hat. carries a skateboard around the whole time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> tell us about Mr. Top Hat and what it's we like need to... like a bad 21 Jump Street. <laughs> or a the best. One. We're doing well, the, the best. horror 21 <laughs> Jump Street is actually the whole hook of the thing, basically. Kids going undercover in the Midnight Society. You, like, drive us to the, the campfire in your Prius or something like that. <laughs> hey, fellow young people, what scares you? <laughs> it just takes the this whole guy. wrong connotation. Um, I play Mr. Top Hat. Uh, he is the, the villain in Rachel's Nightmares and slowly starts to make his way out of them into the real world. Um, and we had a lot of fun with him. Uh, he's terrifying. He is. But also has a very jazzy, uh, snazzy outfit. That he's I got like real flowy hair if you bring that picture back. I forgot <laughs> all about it. And sequins and the top hat. Like, it's, it's a nice ensemble. It's a yeah. villain Bowie. There he is. Look at that. <laughs> Those waves. I don't know why you cut your hair, man. I had other jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Just be Mr. Top Hat forever. How dare you? How dare you be hired elsewhere? Um, but you were a fan of the original growing up, right? Yeah, I mean, a terrified fan. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I think we were probably all too young. Felt like we were too young to be watching it, but I think that was the point. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, I was curious how you would modernize a show like this and make it, like, all of our scary tolerance is a lot higher now. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, like, how are we going to manage to to dial it in at that right mark again, that it's the right, it's the right yeah. level of scary. And I, I think, we, you know, we all, our, our biggest fear was like, oh, we won't want to neuter the show. We wanted to push the limits of what we can do. And I think there were plenty of moments on set where we were like, is this, is this too scary? Is this terrifying? Yeah, I think that always made us really, really excited. We were like, oh, we're going for it. We're, we're trying to make the show as scary as it was to us when we were We were shooting in a 90s. scene in a water tank and our video village was outside and Dean, the director, was inside. And I remember we all watched a thing and looked at each other and we're like, no. And I ran inside and I was like, Dean? He was like, what? I was like, this is too scary. He's like, that's good, right? I'm like, no, this would get an R rating, man. This is like, 10-year-olds <laughs> have to watch this. And he stared at me. He's like, oh, right, yeah, we can't do that. So, uh, but when in doubt, we did shoot a bunch of things that in post then we're like, okay, well, maybe this has to be like 90% less scary <laughs> because I really want 10 year olds to enjoy the show, man. So I just you don't want to traumatize sometime. them too much. You got to be traumatized at some point. It's a hard world out there, man. You got to just got to embrace it. I think <laughs> just traumatize some kids. Um, well, rather than uh, teasing around it, maybe we could show the people a little something about, about something spooky. Anything? All right. Because I'm a genius, I'm going to show you an episode, scene in the middle of episode two that I'm going to have to provide context for so you can understand because this is a three-parter. Uh, in episode two, the kids go to the Carnival of Doom because a, I'll be vague, a character has uh, vanished and they believe he might be there. And there's just two things you need to know. One, uh, before this started, Akiko just got cornered by some scary clowns so when you see her getting chased that has already established and there's also a subplot about a gold coin that the characters are looking for so if you see people pointing at a gold coin and being like we need that it's because it's important <laughs> so all right here's the clip
That was a lot. <laughs> I'm not in that clip, but they all work for me. <laughs> I like to be very clear. It's upsetting the top hat's not in the clip, but you know, you're in a lot of other stuff in the show, so <laughs> they'll see it when it airs. Worth waiting for. Um, those all seem like very freaky situations to be in. Um, for each of you, was there anything on set during filming that actually spooked you? Were there moments where you're like, Aah! I am terrified of heights. It was the easiest scene to get in the character for, ever. <laughs> like, that was the, I mean, I was terrified. I told so many people I loved them that night because I <laughs> figured I was going to die on that, on, that, on that Ferris wheel. I also like to clarify that that's the only scene in which he screams out of the three episodes, so he's not just a guy who screams all of his lines like Goonies, <laughs> as much as I love Goonies. But. For me, it was definitely the clown scenes because I, I hate clowns. <laughs> I absolutely like hate them, and I was being chased by them out of all things, Ben David. <laughs> that was the most fun I ever had shooting anything. <laughs> but no, the people, the people playing them were very sweet. They were like, it's, are you okay? I don't want to scare you. <laughs> but it was quite terrifying. I thankfully didn't share any fears with my character. <laughs> I was worried for a while that Ben David would just write something into the script purposefully to torture me, because it wouldn't be that out of character, I don't think. I, I was going to, but we didn't have enough time to write frivolous there it scenes. Is. <laughs> it was a tight schedule. <laughs> but no, I was lucky. I think everything at the Carnival, Carnival of Doom was terrifying. It, yeah, it was pretty scary. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like it at all, but I liked it a lot. It's great. Um, when you guys, uh, obviously, uh, if you're playing a group of friends, it helps to be friends, and it seems like you guys all get along really well in real life, which is great, but did you, was there any kind of bonding that you guys did? Did Ben Davis, like, lock you in his room? And <laughs> yes, there definitely was. In Vancouver, one of the things we did is, in Vancouver, they have really good food, right? So we bonded over eating. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a good thing to and bond over. And then some of the times after we finished filming, like, sometimes it would be really late, and we were, we were crazy kids, so we decided, let's go down to the gym and all hang out and <laughs> work out for a little bit. So I definitely think there were times where we were able to do crazy things, but at the same time bond through them. We also had movie nights up in the hotel rooms, horror Watch. movies assigned to us by the directors oh. and Ben David. Which it was the Goonies. We actually had Mia watch her first horror movie. It was not fair. <laughs> I didn't get any say 
in anything. I'm what so upset it? you didn't watch Monster Squad. I asked you guys explicitly to do it. And we you were just trying. Didn't. Ben David, we were trying, I promise. We did I not want to you. disappoint you, but it was difficult, and in the end, they decided, oh, let's watch Lights Out. <laughs> I'd much rather watch the other one. So I Lights Out best, was your first. The best bonding experience was we went to a very terrible bowling alley that had, like, tiny bowling pins, and I don't know if it was, like, a cultural thing for Canada. <laughs> yeah. It was so and, fun. And then the bowling balls were, like, this big. They were, like, shot puts or something, but, but our executive producer, Spencer Berman, who's not here because he just had a kid, was inexplicably so good at it, and we were all terrible, and he was, like, very cocky. But I think it made everyone bond because it was the worst bowling experience imaginable. So nice job, kids. <laughs> That's, yeah, I guess that works. Um, Raphael, obviously, having grown up with the show and being able to play the villain, what do you think makes a memorable Are You Afraid of the Dark villain? What did you kind of channel for him? Yeah, that's the the one pressure on it is there's only one there's only you know yeah, one you villain man. here and my and my minions like this backbending uh, uh, carnival lady who's terrifying in this clip. Contortionist. Um, contortionist. Thank you. Um, I, I, something that Ben David and I talked about a lot was that we wanted to make sure that that he was somewhat unpredictable, and so we tried to come up with a few different kinds of personalities that he would have given given the circumstances, but I tend to think the things that are the scariest are the things that you don't have much information about. Yeah. And so we really tried to personally give ourselves a lot of backstory, but really yeah. in the way that, the, that they sort of put the scripts together, make sure that that information is, is given out at a much slower pace than the rest of the plot so that we have time to sort of let the unknown be scary. Yeah. Um, and I think any time a, a villain is being nice to you, mm -hmm. it's really terrifying. Yeah. And so we just leaned into, like, what is it when a villain, like, wants to be around you? Mm. And you're not sure why. Yeah. Liliani, can you talk a little bit about that? Because you guys do have this weird connection that kind of unfolds over the course of the episode. Yes. Um, Mr. Top Hat is Rachel's worst nightmare. And I think filming, we had a lot of fun figuring out why they have a connection and, and where is that from. And I think it was it was terrifying to see Raphael in character. So yeah. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Look at those pants. Oh. Look at those pants. Look He's a little outfit. bit like an evil Willy Wonka, which we had a whole runner about <laughs> Willy Wonka that we cut out for time, which is a bummer because I saw someone on Twitter is like, oh, it reminds me of Willy Wonka. I'm like, well, we had a five minute joke about Gene Wilder <laughs> and Johnny long. Depp and all this stuff. Also a little David S. Pumpkins. I was going to say, what were some of the influences that you drew on for this villain in particular, and maybe for the story? Well, I wrote the part for Rafa because we'd worked together on uh, this movie that he made called Blind Spotting, which is so not good. necessarily a Comic Con movie. It's oh, amazing. But, you you know, must judging watch by it. that applause, I'm saying everyone should watch it, even if you're young and then it's R rated, because I think it's an important movie. Yes. But we had a great time on that, and when I came up with the idea, uh, Matt was like, Well, what ideas do you have to do the show? And one I had, I texted them, was like, I want to do an evil carnival, and I want Rafael Casal to be like an evil Willy Wonka <laughs> ringmaster dude who kidnaps kids. And uh, he really fit the part. I don't know what it was about him that just felt like he could really <laughs> give off that vibe of a creep who kidnaps kids, but yeah. well done, man. <laughs> He's just really terrifying. Thanks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, we, we kind of put together a, a little list and a little mood board of the kind of villains that we loved, and and... I won't, I won't explain why this is true, but I, I, think, I think after one night reading the script for the, the 20th time, I was like, he's kind of, I'm obsessed with Nightmare Before Christmas. If anybody knows that about me. And I was like, he's, he's so Jack Skellington. Yeah. Um, and you'll see why in terms, of, in, in terms of like trying to understand where he's coming from. And so I, I, I think in, in terms of trying to find like, trying to find where his even like off-kilter kindness comes from. There's something about that movie that, that brought it out for me. So somewhere between that and, and, and Gene Wilder and, and Willy Wonka, like there's... There. I rewrote the whole ending based on one sentence you said. You did like a costume thing and you're like, you know, I think this guy, this is why he's doing blank. And I was like, 
oh, hold on. And then I rewrote like the last 10 minutes of the third episode. And now and it's And that's how you part. get more lines, people. <laughs> yeah, if you're ever on a show, just say, hey, you're wrong about this character's motivation. Say it to the dude writing it. And sometimes it actually will work out. Uh, and it's, I think, everyone's favorite part of the show now. So well done, man. Is nice. Well, for the cast, um, we kind of joked about the screaming in the clip, but I, I would be very self-conscious to scream on camera. Did you guys <laughs> prepare? Did you practice? What is your preparation for, for screaming and making scared faces, which you guys have to do fairly frequently throughout the show? I feel so strange saying that there's preparation for screaming, but you're totally right. Yeah, um, yeah screaming is like, is weirdly uncomfortable because it's not something that's natural unless it's like fits the situation um, but the worst part of screaming is doing it in the ADR whenever you're just sitting in this room and you're doing it in front of like three people that are just like watching you really intensely and they're like yeah you just scream <laughs> and then you, you just have to like scream for them while you're watching the screen in front of you um, so yeah it's 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 weirdly uncomfortable I remember I texted Roth when he's doing ADR and he said I'm like how's it going And he's like I've been doing an evil laugh for like nine hours. <laughs> You're just sitting in a booth doing an evil laugh. I'm like, I'm sure you could have done four hours of that. Yeah. But. Can you do that more maniacally, but happy? <laughs> With more intention. Sure. Oh, the many variations. I was thinking on set about how fear doesn't work like a lot of other emotions do when acting. Because when you think about something sad that happened in your past, it's natural to have a reaction to that and even cry but if you think of something that terrified you you don't just scream out of nowhere so it doesn't work that way and you have to you have to try other stuff like breathing really intensely can put you in the right mindset and then just not holding back trying to forget that everyone's there be in the moment yeah I think the, your surroundings are very important. And I think Ben David did a really good job in trying to scare us all, so <laughs> I think Oops. it was pretty easy. <laughs> like I remember we shot two weeks without anyone screaming, and I walked up to Dean and the other producers, I was like, we haven't had anyone scream yet. Is, are we doing something wrong? And then I realized it's like due to the schedule, somehow all the screaming stuff was like near the end, so it was just a lot of days of kids <laughs> screaming, whether for comedic purposes or being scared or whatever. These are just a lot of good answers about screaming, I feel like. I know. <laughs> we can just talk about that all day. Yeah. It's fascinating. I love it. Um, Matt, there are definitely some episodes of the original that completely still give me nightmares, probably, like I said. Like the pool thing, I wasn't kidding. Like that skeleton in the pool. Um, but horror, as Raphael kind of said, is a lot more accessible now. Um, you know, we can kind of stream it. It's kind of everywhere. Um, so how do you decide on the level of scariness? What, what's kind of the line that you guys found? Yeah, I think the biggest thing when we talked about rebooting this, it was the idea that like when we were all kids, uh, it was truly scary. And, and Nickelodeon with SNCC and all that had, yeah. had really gone for it. And, and I think we got their blessing to bring this back. And obviously with streaming, now you have Stranger Things, you've got it. Yeah. Um, we were able to lean more into the Midnight Society and, and have it come through their stories. Yeah. And I think the scare has come off of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, we, we're lucky enough to have great partners who let us really go for it. So, Yeah, when Matt and I first started working together a few years ago, I hadn't done any horror yet and I really wanted to. Uh, and we bonded over our love of like the same horror movies and stuff like that. And he sort of understood my sensibility and he single-handedly got me on a bunch of horror stuff. So thanks for that, Matt. <laughs> but yeah, Matt's a big horror nerd and I think it's probably your favorite genre. Am I speaking yeah. out of turn? No, it is. And I, and I think that we were lucky enough with all of these uh, amazing cast members of the Midnight Society. It was going through that process, trying to find the people who could really do it justice. Um, and then go further beyond it, because in the originals, they didn't really lean into that, and I yeah. think all these guys killed it, so. And Jeremy was in a very small independent film called It, which I... <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot it, about it. It didn't really do much at the box office, but I think some people have discovered it now, yeah. like, at Very their local the blockbuster and Hollywood video, and it's been picking up some steam. <laughs> but, like, Redbox and stuff, they, like, see it, and like, oh, what's this? Yeah. But my favorite thing about working with Jeremy on this was that he played a completely different character in that, and on this, he's like 
the, a big personality and really funny, which is like the exact opposite. Did you enjoy doing that, Jeremy? I'm asking I questions. Doing I love doing that. Love Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you you wrote the perfect character for me, and, and let me let me explore my character a little bit more and, and play with the lines. So I had a lot of fun doing that, of course. You well, played very well. Thank you. <laughs> You're a good. I feel like you have a bright future ahead of you, kid. I think. It's, Thank you. It's good. I'm just getting um, so many compliments right now. I love it. <laughs> well, You're really good on the show, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. I love your shoes. <laughs> I hate how well all of you dress. It's really frustrating. <laughs> but anyway, continue. <laughs> well, Ben David, um, are there any kind of Easter eggs or horror movie homages that you sprinkled in? Uh, we got we got some uh, some lost name. Uh, there's Easter a eggs very excessive there. amount. Uh, some guy tweeted at me yesterday. Is this going to be like the Ready Player One of horror references? Because I did some interview <laughs> where I mentioned most of the things that are referenced on the show and it made me look like a maniac uh, but it's like the town is like Argento and everyone's last name is like my favorite horror director and there's a million homages to the show buried everywhere there was like a guy in a Zebo mask in that clip that is sort of a blink if you miss it thing the whole show is filled with stuff from the original show that if you're like a obsessive fan like me it has like a Where's Waldo kind of element to it of like, oh, if you pause it, there's a thing from that one episode where that thing happened. Uh, so <laughs> it's definitely designed for the super nerd, but also if you don't know any of the things, you won't know you're watching references, which I think is the perfect thing. So like on set, we have like Herbert West Middle School, and I remember there's like 50 crew members. I'm like, does anyone know what that means? And they're like, no. I'm like, good. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's from Reanimator. It's a really good movie, but it's not okay for kids. Um, Matt, back in the original iteration, obviously we didn't have cell phones or social media. Um, it was obviously a lot harder for any kids who were in trouble to call for help. It's usually very isolated. So how do you kind of balance telling a horror story um, with the advances in the show's technology and how do you kind of build it into the storytelling in a way? I mean, I think kids today are obviously naturally locked onto their cell phones at all times, but I think we've created some rules that I think help us justify uh, some of the challenges that you might face of, of, of why aren't we calling, you know, the cops, etc. Phones Magic. are terrible in entertainment, man, because they can just call everybody. Yeah. But luckily you can't, like, call Satan, you know. There's, like, you can't really call <laughs> well, people you? related to, like, supernatural stuff. But it's, it's a tricky balance. You know, this is a big spoiler, so plug yours. But, like, we have a giant plot point that's about a find-a-phone feature on a phone. You know, sorry, I just ruined my own show. But so there's like some modern stuff, but at the same time, we don't want them to feel like Aziz's character in Parks and Rec, where they're just staring at screens all the time. <laughs> right. uh, so I just think we found a balance. That's like my it. answer. I like it. And by bring, bringing the Carnival of Doom into the real world, you're obviously putting the Midnight Society in a lot more danger than they've ever been in before. You know, they were always very safely behind telling the story before. Um, so can you tease anything about how? the Carnival of Doom kind of coming to life uh, impacts them and their journey throughout Well, the, the reason we made the show about the Midnight Society this time, uh, in a lot of ways, just sort of purely for selfish reasons, because I remember being a kid and watching it, and like you'd have that wish fulfillment fantasy of, I wish someone would invite me to join the secret group, and I'm like, who are these kids? Like, how much fun would that be? And I felt like that's a story we hadn't seen yet, because we've seen you know, a million iterations of them telling amazing stories in anthology format, but I really wanted to be like, who are these kids? What would that be like? What would it be like to be invited into a secret society? And having the story be from the point of view of a new girl who gets invited to join. Because I remember watching the pilot, and it starts, and the kids are sitting around a campfire, and they're like, here's this new kid, and he's going to tell a story. I'm like, well, how did they choose that new kid and what was it like to be chosen and how did he feel when they put a bag over his head and yeah. like all that stuff that happens so since we're doing a three episode story i wanted to see that and but at the same time i'd like to clarify it is not like a stories come alive show i mean it's still they tell a story and an element of the show appears in real life in a way that if i say why it'd be a spoiler yeah. it's not like scary stories to tell in the dark right. or goosebumps it's a different thing that I will just be vague about and say in episode three, most of it will be explained. Mm, I like it. Um, so as I said, I was traumatized by the show as a kid. A lot of you guys probably were too. So I guess going down the line, what is the show or movie that you remember being the first thing that scared the crap out of you? What is kind of that traumatic horror experience that stands out to you? Do you want to start? 
at this end, mayhaps. How do I gotta make this <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, I wasn't allowed to watch horror movies at all, so I only knew the TV versions of horror movies where they like cut away right at the violent part. Mm -hmm. And I remember a friend brought over the first Scream movie. Mm -hmm. And the op I'm not gonna describe it, but if people who've seen it know the opening scene gets real violent. And I had no idea you, it was even legal to show that in a movie. <laughs> so I think I just like swept myself into a panic as it escalated. And then just like had to have a talk with my parents like, so you can just stab a person <laughs> in a movie and you didn't warn me at all? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's really tailored my viewing experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think every year around Halloween, like, they would always play Halloween movies, and almost everyone scared me. My big sisters would always make me watch it just so I would get scared. Aww. So, <laughs> I know, <laughs> to, to terrify me, but I think when I was little, every movie, that was scary. The first movie I can remember that really scared me it wasn't even horror it was just that scene in star wars where emperor palpatine <laughs> is being made into what he becomes i don't even and his face is all shriveled and it wasn't even the fact that it must have hurt that scared me i'm just like wow he, he's so ugly <laughs> that's horrifying that's and i'd rude, leave man. the room and then um are we talking about <laughs> One of the reboots of Star Wars? No, we're talking, I think he's talking about one of the prequels, but we're just going to move on from We're going to move on from he's, that, a right? <laughs> he's a different generation than us, man. I know which Star Wars was first. <laughs> but anyway, um, then The Sixth Sense also was the first actual horror movie that I can remember that stuck with me. It's a good one. Very yeah. good one. Thank you. The fact that you guys can even watch these is just amazing me. <laughs> How does it happen? I, I just... Lights Out, which I watched super recently. While we were filming, actually, we watched it. And I... Okay, I kind of hated it. I'm sorry for all those fans out there, but... Mm -mm, nope, can't de cannot deal with it. <laughs> and it's just... I feel like, for me... Because when I was a kid, I was always kind of traumatized by a lot of things, especially the dark. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was just like really scary to imagine someone just in your house when you turn off the lights. Um, I was the same as Rafa. I wasn't really allowed to watch horror movies at all, um, and neither was my best friend. So whenever we got together, we found access to a laptop and looked up what? everything. Um, so, you know, whenever you're, whenever it's the daytime, you're completely safe, right? Where did you get access to a laptop? Uh, that is confidential. My mom is in the audience right now. Uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah, so we used to look up these things called creepypastas, and oh. they, yeah, I, that reaction just shows what I'm about to talk about. Um, they would take, like, an image and, and make it just terrifying and have a terrifying backstory about it. And the first one I found, so unlucky, was Jeff the Killer. <laughs> <That> re <laughs> um, and so I found that, and then um, that was the first night I ever pulled an all-nighter. No joke. Like, I actually pulled an all-nighter, and I was terrified. But that just sounds scary. It's terrifying. And it's, then why'd you do it? Well, because you're safe in the day, and then you're, like, driving home, and you see woods. We're never safe. But yeah. Jeff the Killer is, like, name the bad guy. It's like, that's not... It's like, so if you're, like, Mike the Vampire, I don't really feel like... <laughs> Like, the name has to negate the scariness because well, it's so... I was, like, nine, so... Oh, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just right. trying to disrespect you. Okay, so there's two things that traumatized me as a kid very specifically, and they're movies that are not scary as adults, but I must have been four years old, and I couldn't sleep, and I walked downstairs, and my parents were watching Gremlins, and it was a scene... And look, I also want to say that Gremlins is really good, but Gremlins 2 is the masterpiece. But anyway, so... I go downstairs and it's the scene where they're at the bar and like they have a gun and all this stuff and you're like a four-year-old and you're just like, you, you know there's rules of the universe, like there's people and there's animals and there's like trees and, but I'm seeing these things that look very real that I didn't know existed and it like, I couldn't sleep for weeks. And uh, so then it, somehow another like PG movie completely messed with my head was, I think it was like literally weeks later, I go downstairs, 
they're watching Ghostbusters, and Ghostbusters is like, when you're a kid, no one remembers, like, that Ghostbusters is actually really scary when you're, like, a little kid. Yeah. And it was the dog. Marshmallow Man. They had, like, no, but it was, like, the giant dog gargoyle thing. Mm -hmm. It scared the crap out of me. <laughs> I just kept thinking, I'd, like, lay in bed and think I hear the dog coming up the stairs or it was going to, like, jump through the window, and I just was, for years, scared of the dog from Ghostbusters, man. You're worse than me. I am worse than everyone, yes, that's very true. Uh, anyway, Matt, what traumatized you, Matt, man? Those are very traumatized. I would say this show, the original of yeah. this, was the first thing that kind of kicked it off for me, and yeah. that's why I wanted to remake it. Yeah. Oh, third one. Yeah. Uh, Shining was on TV. I wasn't allowed to watch oh, that. It was on TV. In the, the shower scene with the old lady, oh, I, yeah. I think I vividly remember crying watching yeah. it. <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's enough answer. Mine was E.T., so don't even... When he's on the ground and pale. No, I like that part. I'm a monster. When he's dying, you like terrifying. that part? I know. But no, like when he, when they like find him in the closet and his head pops up and he like screams and makes that awful noise. I was like four. I was watching it alone. My dad has never I was scared of the down. dudes in the suits in the driveway. Like that. You're scared of like really... the natural things that one should yeah, be man, scared I of. I was scared of E.T., the very nice, friendly alien. Okay. So. Okay. M much childhood trauma. It's terrible. Um, we want to get to some audience questions. I know that there are microphones here and here, so if you would like to line up, then we will call on you. Uh, let's go right over here. Yes. Hi, guys. Uh, Jillian. I'm from New York. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys. This is obviously, you feel it too, such a nostalgic factor. Um, and it looks like you're really capturing that, that kind of spirit that the show had. Um, but I guess kind of, especially for the cast, uh, Jeremy, especially you, when you have a show like this that people have such a nostalgia factor, or a movie like it that people have such a nostalgia factor for it, how do you guys um, feel, deal, and express the pressure of that? Well, I... <laughs> we did it at the same time. I definitely think that because there was such a big fan base already, I feel like we all kind of felt, well, first we felt honored, but then we all kind of felt kind of pressured because the original was just, from what I've seen, was just really amazing and it was so like groundbreaking for its time and I feel like we kind of all felt like that's what this had to be. It had to be groundbreaking for now. And I think we all just kind of, we did our best, and we were just hoping that it would be as good as the original. And with our amazing team, I think it has, it's definitely going to be that. I think people are going to love it. I really do. Jeremy, what was it like to star in it? <laughs> this is about Are You Afraid of the Dark today. <laughs> you were really good in that movie. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, oh. how's it going? My question's for the new Midnight Society. If there was one thing that you could ask the old Midnight Society, what would it be? Ooh. And then also, uh, Wizard of Oz was the one thing that scared the absolute crap out of me. The witch. The monkeys, too. Well, no, man. the witch. Well, man. <laughs> I um, would have them settle a debate that was started in our show. I'm not sure if I can Are say Are we allowed to say that? You can okay. talk about anything except that one thing I said you can't talk about. <laughs> I would ask them if... Sci-fi can be horror. That's and a good aliens question. Aliens are horror. <laughs> um, Don't I would do ask this them, man, David. <laughs> I would ask them if, in the filming of the original, if they ever burnt themselves in the campfire, because <laughs> that stuff gets hot. I would probably ask them, what would they do if they went to the Carnival of Doom? I'd probably ask if they have any advice for us. I think there's always something to learn. Awesome. Thank you. Good Thank question. You. Let's go over here. In the original, we had Mr. Venkis show up in multiple episodes. Might he show up as something interesting again? Who knows, man? <laughs> no, man, it's my time to shine, okay? <laughs> Let Mr. Top have his moment. Look, uh, if we're lucky enough to ever make more of these, there's no way that dude's not going to show up, but he's not in these. So, sorry. But so, everyone else is in it. Everything else you could imagine from the show is in it, but just not that dude. So just watch it, and then they'll make more. Let's go over here. Hi, I'm Skylar. I'm right here in Manhattan. I think a lot of millennials would want to know Ben David. 
<laughs> that as someone who is very stuck on the nostalgia from back in the 1992, 1991, and all that stuff, I'm probably not going to get a straight answer, but do you plan on bringing any of the old Midnight Society in as any villains or any characters in we the We call Gosling. We, you know, here's the thing about Ryan Gosling. We're, we're just, <laughs> we're having a little bit of a feud because very busy. I was like, hey, Ryan Gosling, do you want to be in this show? And he just didn't reply. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we called his agent and they were like, he might be interested, but they just kept saying he might be. And what I was really feeling is, it would have been cool if we had Ryan Gosling in the show. Like, I really wanted to end it like he was supposed to be Mr. the Pop end Pat. of Tokyo Drift, where he shows up like Dom does, and that would have been like, and then the next season would be all about Ryan Gosling, but he's also expensive, which is, it sucks, but we do have some people from the original show in this show. Uh, I won't say who, even if you have IMDb on your phones and you can look up who's on the show. <laughs> But there's some people who you might go, oh, wow, they were from the original show. Uh, and I would like to, in theory, use more actors from it. The thing that's helpful is we shot in Canada. The original show was shot in Canada, and it's easy to use Canadian actors in Canada because they're from Canada. So <laughs> I actually tried to get, um, there was a guy, the, the co-creator of, um, uh, I'm just forgetting, it's like the funniest Canadian show in the whole world where the guys just stand like King of the Hill and drink beer and fight each other. Uh, Letter Kenny, I, my brain's mush today, man. The co-creator of that show was one of the original Midnight Society, and he was busy. I was trying to get him in it, but, you know, you can't win all your battles. Anyway, was that a weird answer? Probably. I think it was a great answer. And I have to know where you got your boots. Those are adorable. I don't know. <laughs> it's not my clothes, but I love them, too. I've been walking around, and I'm like, wow, these are actually not hurting. Whoa. <laughs> they look good, and they're comfortable. So, that's <laughs> very Joker on mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go back over here. Hi, my name is Seth. I'm from Binghamton, New York. Uh, growing up with uh, Are You Afraid of the Dork, I was always really surprised by a lot of the stuff they put on Nickelodeon in that show that some of it was really scary, in, in particular the tale of the dead man's float that she that's keeps mentioning. Yep. Was there anything that you wanted to put in the show that you decided was just going to be too scary for, for Nickelodeon in this day and age? Man. Uh, you know, I mentioned a thing earlier about going and telling Dean that we were going a little too far in a moment. Uh, there's a uh, sequence in the third episode that I... <laughs> it ended up being even scarier than I was sort of expecting, and everyone watches it. And I very stupidly wrote in the script, this is going to be the scariest thing in the whole show. And then it ended up being that. Uh, I kind of... I shot everything that I wanted to do, and then the theory was in post, maybe the network would watch it and say, no, you idiot, you can't put that on a show for 10-year-olds. But they actually ended up really being supportive of all the scary stuff. I mean, even the marketing has actually been pretty scary, which I wasn't, even that kid was scared, man. Uh, no, I, I sort of got to get away with everything I wanted to, so thanks, Nickelodeon. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Back over here. Um, I was just wondering for like the kids of the group, did you guys watch or have to watch the Are You Afraid of the Dark? And if so, which of the episodes did you think were the scariest? Personally, I did not watch any full episodes, unfortunately. But I watched a lot of clips from the original show. And I don't quite know all the names, but there were some moments, uh, especially in the one where there's the pool and then the... the I don't even know what you call it, like a skeleton yeah. zombie skeleton. Yeah. type thing. <laughs> That's the one. The thing that looks like the thing in our show um, comes up, and I was like, wow, that's actually really scary. And it's scarier than I thought it was, especially for Nickelodeon. I've gotten to see some, and kind of like Mia said, a lot scarier than I imagined it would be. I mean, there's like clowns choking girls and <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> there were clowns chasing one. <laughs> that was the best thing about working with Dean, our director, is I wrote a scene that was supposed to be like the foot, the point break foot chase, but with clowns chasing two kids, which you saw a part of there. And I'm like, this is gonna be really difficult. We only can shoot for two hours a night with kids. We're having people chasing extras. And he's like, they're gonna be on stilts. And I was like, no, and I didn't 
changed the script and I gave him another draft and he's like, they should be on stilts. And I said, no, they're not going to be on stilts. You, that's never going to get done. And then I show up on set and there's two clowns on stilts. <laughs> and it was the most fun I ever had shooting anything. We had like a hundred foot dolly track chasing two guys on two people on stilts running like full speed chasing you. <laughs> you didn't seem to like that. And it was they, raining. <laughs> they are fast. They were so fast and I was surprised because they were actually asked to go slower. Because me and the other girl, they were catching up to us and so right, they got stilts. Like, yeah, they got longer legs. That makes sense. No, but like, I didn't think they'd be able to go that fast on stilts. Because they're on stilts. They're like a million feet up in the air. And so Dean was like, can you guys possibly go slower for the cast? Because you they were guys too are fast for the cameras, fast. man. Hey, what, what do you guys think of the original show? Did you watch any of it? Yeah, I've got to see a lot of footage from it, too. And I think that that also was among my favorites, that clown rising up out of the water. Skeleton. The skeleton, sorry. Zebo the clown also is another thing that was floating around in my head, which I thought was cool. But that was the one that I've heard stories about people not wanting to go swimming after seeing it. And I think that if we do our job right, we'll ruin a lot of other big <laughs> parts of the world for everyone. I'm sorry. And yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what lasting legacy our show makes. Yeah, we, we played an episode for some kids and the nine-year-old girl jumped under the table during part because she couldn't look at the TV and I was like, that's a success. <laughs> <laughs> We've done our jobs. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm from Queens. And one of my favorite episodes growing up was uh, the Tale of the Renegade Virus. That one was the one that really creeped me out. And that was my first one to get me hooked on the show. Um, so it kind of piggybacks to what the other girl mentioned. Instead of what was the scariest one for you, because you guys had to watch it, what was your favorite episode? There's the, what's the one? It's like the tale of the 13th floor, I think. It's where it's like these toy maker, faceless aliens. Like, scary. It's not the scariest one, but man, that one was really cool. I haven't seen an episode. I'm sorry. Aww. He couldn't get access to a laptop that had one. <laughs> he only found laptops without episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark? I deserve that. I deserve that. You don't hey, man, you're great. You're really good in it. <laughs> he was so in character, he wouldn't touch a keyboard because of the germs. It was amazing. <laughs> Do you Method have acting. Method. Very. And Mia's too, too scared of anything. She couldn't watch a whole episode. <laughs> I think we've already pulled that together from the information I've already said. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I definitely... I'm, I apologize, but we only watched clips, and I think from the clips, there were moments where I was like, oh, that's really cool, yeah. but... None of really that, like, we're like, oh, wow, that's an amazing episode, because, unfortunately for me, horror is not my favorite. <laughs> and you play a horror director, so <laughs> you're a very that's talented, you boss. sold that, I mean, yeah, but you sold it very well. She directs a zombie movie and a werewolf movie on the show. Yeah. Yay. Acting. Acting. Good, acting. Good acting. Thank you so much. Hi, how you doing? My name is Marcus. Well, first off, I would like to say, over the years, I've watched Are You Afraid of the Dark with my brothers, Martin and Michael, and I was really shocked that it's now being returned on Nickelodeon. I'm really happy about that. It's one of my favorite Halloween shows. So, Jeremy, for my question to you, you were in so many other horror movies I've seen. You were in It, It Chapter 2, and you were in my favorite movie, Goosebumps 2, Haunts and Halloween. So I would like to know, What's it like for you to be part of the Midnight Society in Are You Afraid of the Dark? It's very surreal, actually. Um, to be a part of this, like, society is, is really, really cool. I know it's, like, you know, like, it's, it's in the show, so it's, like, fake. But it's really, really surreal to be, like, in the Midnight Society. It just feels like it's cool to have that title. Cool. So it's very surreal. Ah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. You guys could just do a Midnight Society, you know? You don't have to. You could just go into the woods and tell well, people. Well, maybe it does exist. And who's no to say we haven't? Uh, even we have to be secretive. That's well, true. I'm sorry. I'm blowing up exist, your spot. Or if someone were to create one, we can't know. It's true. <laughs> it's secret society. That's true. I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> Next question. Hello. I'm Heather from Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, my favorite genre is horror. And even thinking back, 
the things that actually scared me the most still came from Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, one vivid memory I have is, I can't remember the exact episode, but the girl was in a group and they were stealing people's faces, and that just stuck with me. Uh, within the original Are You Afraid of the Dark, or just anything in general, if you haven't seen it, what types of things have stuck with you throughout um, that maybe wasn't really scary, but just psychologically scary for you? From Are You Afraid of the Dark or from anything? From anything. Anything. Are you afraid of the dark if you've seen it, but if not, anything? Um, I would say The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Um, How did you see that? <laughs> that you I had a laptop. It's from the creepy pasta thing. <laughs> it's the laptop um, access, man. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that was that was the most psychologically thrilling movie I've ever seen, and it was like, it sticks with you, but there's like nothing to be afraid about. It's just makes you awkwardly uncomfortable. Okay, for me, I feel like it can't not be scary for me, because <laughs> I just. I'm, I'm a chicken, I know. But for me, the thing that sticks with me most, probably because I've seen it really recently, or maybe it's just utterly terrifying, is Diana from Lights Out. Like, I just, I cannot get over it. <laughs> Don't laugh at No, it's just my, my friend wrote and produced Lights Out, and I just, I love so much that you keep bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw Child's Play, but that wasn't really, like, scary. It was more, like, funny and gory, I guess. No, hey. thank you. Hey, Bride of Chucky, that is the movie. That's all I'm saying. I think that scene in The Sixth Sense where they lock the kid up in the attic and they don't know that he can see the ghosts in there and they're, um, I mean, it doesn't show what's going on. And that's why I think it is a good answer to that question because it's just up to you to imagine what's happening and you just hear and yeah, it's disturbing. Yep. It's very disturbing. I can't remember the name of it, and if anybody knows it, shut it out. Um, it's, the, it's the movie with the two witches, and they kidnap this boy, and they're like really creepy, and they come to this like old town in Halloween. Hocus Pocus? Is that Hocus Pocus? Is that Hocus Pocus? Hocus, is it three Hocus witches? I was about to say, that's three witches. Three witches. Oh, three witches. I'm bad at that. Three witches. Yes, Hocus Pocus, okay. I think, yeah. That's Where they, like, steal the souls of the children yes. and have the book mm -hmm. and stuff. That's is the woman one. from Sex and the City in it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> Raphael, what's, what's what scarred you from... Doesn't have to be a scary thing, but if it's what like, scar, yeah, I'll tell you what scar me. So there's a, without. <laughs> this is a good preamble. <laughs> without without giving too much away in the show, there's a big thread of scorpions in this show, and they kept bringing them to set, <laughs> and I made it very clear that I didn't want to be near anything that's this big and an insect, um, but they wanted to shoot a promo with me holding one in front of my face. And I refused to hold it, but I said it could be in front of my face. And so somebody else held it, and it was just trying to get me. <laughs> and there's a great video. I'll put it on my Instagram later. I have the video, and they hold it in front of Rafa, and he's frozen. And he just goes, bruh. <laughs> <laughs> Staring at this giant scorpion. And they're not even using it. The promo has not come out. Yeah, it was, it was just, we only did it to mess with you, man. <laughs> Uh, and there's a, I have a pretty terrifying boomerang of me holding like a giant scorpion in my hand uh, that we use for the show. And I don't recommend holding a giant scorpion in your hand. It is a terrifying, it was like as big as this. It was horrible. And then the other thing I'm probably scared of is speaking in front of crowds. You're doing good. You're doing just fine. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Matt, are you scared of anything? Oh, yeah, Matt. What traumatized you? Diane Slee Grinner. Hey, good reference. Hi, I'm Matt from Boston. Um, one thing I really liked about the original show and just horror from the 80s and 90s was the practical effects, like growing up with the monster makeup and the animatronics. And uh, I have distinct memories of Angelica Houston in The Witches when I was six. And uh, that one scene where like all the witches are together and they just slowly transform. And I was wondering if you could speak more to um, 
the approach of the horror in terms of practical effects versus relying on heavy CGI. Well, those were some real skeletons we had in that video clip. Those were just, we found them in a thing, uh, and they just walked up and they're like, hey, can we be in your, yeah. Those are physical uh, I think ones. most of our stuff we try to keep practical mm -hmm. and physical effects. I don't, I, even though CGI is obviously getting better and better, um, when you make something for the prices that, that we were making this for, I think it's always better if it's in reality. We have some CG scorpions and some real scorpions, <laughs> and I dare you to find out which ones are different. You'll, you'll probably know because the ones are digital, but uh, we, have a, we have a good combination of stuff, I'd say. Cool. Thank good you. Question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elise. I'm from Connecticut. Um, I grew up watching Are You Afraid of the Dark and then went on to other horror anthologies, and now I'm helping at horror conventions, so this was big in my life, I guess. Uh, it sounds a lot like this three parts is similar to the movie from around 2000, the Are You Afraid of the Dark three part uh, Tale of the Silver Sight. And I'm wondering if this drew anything from that. And also we learned that there's been a Midnight Society since like early, early on generations ago. So is this the same Midnight Society or is it a branch of it? My feeling about the Midnight Society is I like the idea that maybe we have no idea how many they are because they're so secretive. Uh, like, you know, there might even be two in the same school, but the kids don't know that the other ones coexist. To me, that's the fun part about the show is like, you don't know, there could be one in Phoenix, there could be one in Oregon, there could be one in, you know, London, uh, just any place where you can have a fire that people can sit around. Uh, there is some references to some of that stuff, but I'm not gonna spoil it, but I will say that I thought that three-parter was pretty cool. Thank you, good question. Thank you. Yeah, hey, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this question's more for Ben David and Matt as the horror buffs. Who are your favorite horror movie icons and protagonists of all time? Well, my top three horror movies of all time would be American Werewolf in London, That's cool. Black Christmas, and then Return of the Living Dead. Uh, basically, I'd say everyone in those movies are my favorite. Also, The Shining, wait. I love. Poltergeist. Pretty good movie. Poltergeist is Poltergeist so is good. Amazing. Those are definitely my top ten. Uh, yeah, I mean, not the you know, that, yeah, no comment on that one. But, I mean, obviously remakes can be okay. Uh, <laughs> but I would also just like to give a shout out to Halloween 3, which I think is a perfect movie. Uh, I think that Tom Atkins is a god. In fact, next Sunday, or two days from now, I'm going to do a triple of The Fog, Night of the Creeps, and um, Halloween 3 on film. I'm excited about that. It's at Beyond Fest, which is the same place where our show is premiering on Monday. That's right. I'm pretty excited about it. But that's excited. Los Angeles. Sorry, guys. Go to LA, guys. You can do it. Uh, final question. Um, I, I'm just here to say, and I'm not being funny here, but probably the best thing I saw at Comic Con so far, not just this panel, but the fact that there's a character whose name isn't just Raimi, but that it rhymes with Sam. This is such a. I'm really I, sorry about that. No, no, no. That, I'm, <laughs> it's I'm just, just saying, deeply um, nerdy. You know, it, it might sound a little silly, but just um, something that small really, uh, some people got a kick out of that. So uh, I like what you guys are doing. Good luck. And Ash's you. character's last name is Coscarelli, and I met Don Coscarelli recently and showed him proof that his last name was Coscarelli, and he looked like he was in a cry. So that made me feel okay about being a giant stupid nerd and naming people like Graham Raimi. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, thanks, man. Yep. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. That is sadly all we have time for, but Are You Afraid of the Dark premieres Friday, October 11th at 7 p.m. on Nickelodeon, so remember to tune in. And with that, I declare this meeting of the Midnight Society closed. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Guys.